everybody. I'm Karen Hartglass. You're listening to It's All About Food. Thank you for joining me today. We're going to have an interesting conversation on a lot of different topics. And I can't do this without my awesome partner, Gary DiMatteo. Welcome, Gary. Karen! Yay! Gary! It's Tuesday. And you it's know what Tuesday, that means. And you We're know gonna... what that means. We're going to have a special guest, woo, me. Woo, I'm the special guest. <laughs> and I listen to Karen's It's All About Food, Karen Hart Glasses, It's All About Food, because <laughs> I want to keep informed of the horrors of the world, but also of a lot of tasty treats and yeah. a lot of wonderful things. And I'm excited to talk to you about all of that, not only just the bad stuff, but the good stuff. It's an interesting thing I try and juggle, which is being aware of everything that's going on in the world. And a lot of it is bad and violent and sad and upsetting and frustrating. But at the same time, living a life that's joyful, seeing right. the good, finding the beauty and eating wonderful, delicious food. Yes. And I can't wait to talk about all of that because we've been doing a, a little bit of that, not as much as we normally do. And we'll talk about that the reason why as well, because someone might be in a show. <laughs> Stay tuned. Okay. First, Stay I want tuned. to talk about morning yeah, routines, so what do, oh, habits, yes. and exercises. First, That's I want to fun. talk about, yeah. Did you get that? Morning routines. Yeah. <clears throat> I got it. Cool. Um, so I get up in the morning, usually before you, and I enjoy the peacefulness <laughs> And you might laugh because our building can be very noisy like today. <laughs> right. But it, usually it's peaceful. And I there are some things I like to do. I like to make my tea. I like to hydrate. I like to sit down and kind of wake up and do my Duolingo exercises. I'm fluent in French and I like to keep up and learn better grammar. And also I'm doing Spanish and German and I love languages. And then ideally... I would like to do yoga or stretching. Right. Very good. That sounds wonderful. Yeah. Except I don't always get to the exercise because it's not an ideal world. Yes. And well, why and do you think you don't? Why? So why do you think you don't get to the exercise? Why is that not a priority? Let's talk about that. Well, that's, that's the, the, the crux in my mind. I feel like, I don't have time, mm -hmm. but it's all about prioritizing. And maybe I don't prioritize, or maybe I do prioritize and exercise just doesn't make it to the top all the time. And right. I prior prioritize other things. That's the question. Right. And well, I mean, languages are important to you. So that is something you definitely are telling us that you, you really prioritize. want to pri prioritize that. So what is difficult for you is maybe to start thinking about putting yoga in that same category as as duo. But when I do, maybe they I'm should. So there happy. should be. Maybe there should be. A, or there probably is an app that's like duo duo yoga, where you <laughs> you actually use the app to to exercise. Because well, I have I have favorite videos that I like to watch to do yoga routines. There you go. But yeah, I mean those those require more effort whereas you just have your phone and you just click on the app and it's like daily yoga i bet yeah. there's i bet there's something out there listeners if you know of something like this let us know well there's plenty of books there's plenty of podcasts there's plenty of everything that tell us how to improve our habits or create new habits and add exercise to our routine and i want to admit that i was on a really good path at the beginning of the year i was really inspired to do more cardio, cardio, because <laughs> I was concerned about my heart and my high cholesterol, and I wanted to do more vigorous cardio. And I was inspired by Sid Garza Hillman, who wrote Ultra Running for Normal People, Life Lessons Learned on and Off the Trail. And I interviewed him, I think, in February. And what I liked about talking with him, I'm not interested at all in doing ultra running. Uh, now, but, now, what is ultra running again? I remember, I remember when you interviewed Sid. It was a great interview. And it's fifty he's, miles. It's more yeah. than it's more than a marathon. Seriously, it's that's, an insane distance. 
Yeah, yeah, you can't you can't be doing that unless you're Sid Garza and well, company. but but his point was anybody can do it. But what I liked about his approach was you don't just get out and run as fast as you can. What you do is you run slowly. Yeah, and I running like that. slowly helps you develop your strength and maybe ultimately can you can increase your speed but it's it's nothing that's that feels bad it feels good and so i started with that approach and i really was enjoying it and then you got covid and i got covid yeah that was a while ago that was in february and and so mm. i i fell off that routine and then like when I recovered from that a few weeks later or four weeks later or something, I got the flu bad. You didn't get it. We were no. really good about that, but I get the flu badly maybe once a, every 10 years or so. And this, I guess was my moment, but that happened and it took a while to feel good and recover. And then I started rehearsals for a show we will talk about in a moment. And uh, I fell. It was a rainy day all day and it was after rehearsal and I was looking at my phone and I fell off a curve and I hurt, hurt my foot. And even though I went to an ER and got an x-ray and there were no sprains and it wasn't broken, it's been about six weeks now. It's still kind of swollen, right? Um, but I'm now able to move and, and feel better about it. But that okay. just broke well, into my you, exercise routine. Your timing is perfect because- the weather is getting better mm. and it's going to get you outside and you're going to do, I saw you the other day, I was playing tennis and you were taking laps around the track and you're starting again. So don't beat yourself up. But if there's an app out there, because Karen is very appy, she's an appy person. She likes apps. There's a yoga app out there that, that you think is great for Karen. Let her know. Cause she'll use it, right, Karen? You know, I'm I'm pretty good with these YouTube videos that I love, and I can look at them on the phone. Okay. So well, there I, you go. I got that covered, I think. Okay. It's well, just getting motivated to throw the mat out and get there. I think you can do it. Okay, or maybe, but, you, maybe you maybe you want to change to uh, to jogging around the track. Well, I like to do both. I mean, my ideal is to do the stretching yoga thing in the morning and then later on do the cardio. Okay, I get that because, you know, it it's it, it goes with who you are. It goes with your personality. I mean, you don't just want to do one language. You're doing three languages <laughs> now. And, and you're not just doing one podcast. You're also doing a podcast in French. So I get that about you. So you're an overachiever. Have you always been an overachiever? Yes. I somehow, I somehow imagine you, and I've said this before, and it's, it bears <laughs> repeating is that at when you were in high school and it's like five minutes until the bell's supposed to ring to let everybody go home. Were you the person that raised your hand and said, teacher, teacher, you didn't give us homework. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. no. <laughs> I, get, I get that. I get, I mean, you forgot to give us homework. But when it comes to food, that's another thing with habits because I know people want to eat better and they find themselves maybe on a path for a week or two and then they fall off the path and they it's eat something nice. that they shouldn't have and or didn't want to. It's nice to know you're human, Karen. Sometimes I'm human. I've, I've had my doubts and hey, it's great. <laughs> Share that with us. Share the fact that you're human because a lot of us, we think you're a machine. I'm not a machine, sugar. Who said another that? My dad, he had many famous lines and that was one of them. Right. So, so morning routines, uh, including food, what are some of the things you said you get up and you hydrate, you drink tea and, and does that also include a s certain type of tea that you like, or do you change uh, that up? I, I have a selection. I like by Mudan, a white tea. I find it very refreshing. It, I love to smell the leaves before I put them in the pot. Mm -hmm. Gives me this image Sim of a big meadow with fresh air. It's lovely. And then jasmine green or again, micha. That's what I'm drinking right now, which has some roasted rice in it. I like mate, yerba mate. Sometimes I'll do something that isn't caffeinated. We've used a juicer to juice fresh ginger. Mm -hmm. And then I pour them into these silicon trays. 
pastries, in, yeah. Yeah, in tablespoon amounts and freeze them. And then so we have a bag of little tablespoon portion sizes of ginger juice. And I like to take them and put them in hot water, maybe with a little turmeric. I should take a- fresh, I should take fresh turmeric and juice it, but I haven't yet. We use the powder. And That's a great you- tip, everybody. Juicing your ginger and then freezing it in little round discs in silicon trays, which can also be put in the freezer and silicon trays can also be put in the oven. And it's a really great way to keep your ginger. And ginger's your, wonderful. Yeah, it's great in everything. It's great in everything, yeah. There's a, there's a restaurant in Manhattan called, well, a lot of them are doing it, but Peace Food in Manhattan. And um, they do these great ginger lattes and they make them with soy milk. And they're delicious, and we oh, do them. Oh, they're home very too. rich and decadent, but they've got good things in them, right? They've got good things, and they're they're really great. I like one of those in the morning. Okay, one mm-hmm. of the things that impacts my routine is now different people have their own lifestyles. A lot of people have a nine to five job, so they have a very specific routine because their job is right smack in the middle of the day, and it affects everything they do. And I respect that. We are artists. We have a little more flexibility in our schedule, but right now I'm in a show and the show was rehearsing mostly in the evenings, weekends, and now we're in performances. And And what show are you doing, Karen? I'm doing A Little Night Music, a musical by Stephen Sondheim. Mm, And where are you doing it, Karen? (laughs) It's at the Mark O'Donnell Theater in Brooklyn. And we have four performances left. We've been running for three weeks and our last week is this week. And I just wanted everybody to know if you're in the New York City metro area, you should come and see this show. It's really charming. It's in a little black box theater. It's very intimate. Like the whole ensemble is very strong, very even. And I'm in it and I sing a nice song that even talks about food. You know, I, I just need to I need to chime in here as well and and reiterate what Karen just said. You really should. It is a lovely production. The cast and the casting are incredible. It's a, a Karen is brilliant, but the entire company is is really really terrific. And I'm not a theater reviewer, but if you're looking for an intimate production, the company is Theater 2020, and they've been in existence since they were That's, called Theater 1010. Yeah, about 20 years. So they've they've been in existence 20 years. The company is run by Judith. What is Judith's last name, Karen? Judith, Judith Jarrett and David Muller. David and, Fuller, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, it's great. It's a great team, and the, the show is great. And they use professional actors, and it's a showcase production sanctioned by Actors' Equity. And the company is really wonderful. Check it out. Um, I've seen it three times, and I'm going to probably go back one more time. And that's that's because Karen's in it, but also I really enjoy it. And I don't like anything. I hate everything. No. So, so the reason why we're bringing it up not just because I want to promote this show and have you come to it, but because it's affected my morning routine because most of the performances are late. Sometimes we'll go out after I really try not to eat late because we all know that's not a good thing, but sometimes after a show you come home and you're hungry and those sorts of things are really a challenge to deal with. So I respect those people who have those sorts of schedules, working grave shifts or night shifts or working late and have to figure out how to eat well and eat appropriately. But if your schedule, yeah, if your schedule doesn't allow you to not eat before going to bed, what are some of the foods you should eat before going to bed? Well, things that are easy to digest because you don't want to lie down right after eating, number one. And you don't want to have things in your belly digesting when you're going to sleep because sleep is the time to detox. Sleep is the time to rejuvenate. And if you're digesting, then all those other things are not going to do what they're supposed to do while we're sleeping. 
Right. So easy, easily digestible foods. Yeah, fruit, probably. Avocado. Yeah. Avocado is a little, a little heavier because it's got a lot of fat in it. Big bowl of guacamole. But, it is, and... but avocado is a fruit, so it's very satisfying. Big bowl of guacamole and chips <laughs> for bed. That, that would be that would be what Gary would do. Make a big bowl of guacamole and have a bunch of chips. No. Kidding. No. Okay. So that's morning routines, the challenges. We're we're all human. We're not perfect. We try the best we can. That's right. We are not perfect. Well, yeah. practically perfect. I'm practically but... perfect <laughs> in every way. So there's a lot of things, the horrible things going on in the world. And we should talk about those first. And um, and you know. I listen to Karen's show and I listen to this podcast because I am informed. I, I want to be informed with the truth. The responsible eating and living is all about the truth. And sometimes you don't get the truth from the news outlets. So, uh, so this is why I listen. And I wrote this little piece and I'd like to read it mm. and clear up what it is because we're also we're also all about giving people things to think about. So here we go. I am informed of the horrors of the world, the senseless suffering and slaughtering of humans and animals and nature by humans. Humans slaughter the suffering daily. Humans slaughter the innocent daily. Humans slaughter the soil and the seeds and the seas daily, taking innocent lives destroying millions of earthlings and their environment every second, directly and indirectly, and always for profit, or for personal gain, or in the name of whatever diet or deity or ancient text they subscribe to. The killing and the suffering is never telecast until it's sure to bring ratings and a market share and more profits to the few who pull the strings, the rulers of the mob. The daily suffering humans inflict on one another and on other creatures and on nature are not widely publicized until there is potential for profit. The manufacturers of weapons and slaughtering equipment know this. The manufacturers of herbicides and pesticides know this. They know this and use this to promote their products. According to the puppet masters who manipulate the media, there is killing that is marketable and killing that is bad for business, and the marketable killing shall be telecast and shared and posted and memed because there will be profit at the expense of the victims and the killing that is bad for business shall be kept hidden behind the curtain. I am informed of the truth, but not through subsidized programming. Not through corporate news telecasts. I do not watch and I do not click and I do not scroll and I do not meme. To the rulers of the mob, I am a threat because I do not participate. To them, I am an outlier living on the fringe. I am anti-mob, anti-tribe, anti-watch. The killing and the suffering aren't new. They are centuries old, millennial old. The paid advertising is relatively new. But the horrors and the murdering and the raping and the killing are as old as the myth, myths and the killing fields and the slaughterhouses, centuries old. Today, the mob determines what slaughter to telecast, what slaughter is watchable over and over again, and what is not. Programming the mob to click, programming the mob to hate. Programming the mob to fear, to kill, to buy, to consume, to medicate, or to be or not to be. It is overwhelming to keep from being part of the mob. I'm often lonely and frightened and tempted to capitulate. But no price is too high to pay for the privilege of owning yourself. Thank you. Wow. Well, Gary, so there are there who are, are you? There Where do are, these things come from? Well, there are programs like yours, like It's All About Food, which I've been listening to now for many, many years. And I'm a co-founder of Responsible Eating and Living. And 
the reason we do what we do is to bring this truthful information, this live, lively banter that you have with authors and doctors, and sometimes they're one and the same. An author is, an also, is also a doctor and cookbook authors and, and all of the folks that you've interviewed. To, to give folks something that is a buffer between all of the paid, it, forgive the, I hope the bulls forgive me, bullshit <laughs> that, that we have to sift through and the sensationalism that that is out there, uh, like what you're about to talk to now, which I think is a, is a nice segue, the, th the, the horrible things that are going on in Florida yet again, and, Thank you, uh, Gary. That was great. I really appreciate your writing. It always blows me away when I read it or you read it and I hear it. And you thanks. just create this stuff on a daily basis in your journaling. It's oh, I mean, amazing. it really is true that, that you know, w what prompted me to write it was a lot of people are saying that if we don't respond to what the corporate media is telling us to respond to on platforms like social media that we don't care. I mean, people are trying to guilt you into, into making a comment about one horrible thing or the other. And I just find that insulting because I don't have to respond to something that somebody throws out there simply because they are trying to guilt me into doing it. I know the horrors of the world and the folks that usually are telling us to respond to these things are are these folks that are the biggest offenders of what it is that we talk about on this program they're normally meat eaters you know which i'm not trying to vilify i was once a person who ate flesh but because of you and because of this program i have seen that that's insanity and you, there are a lot of articles being written now. I mean, we just talked about one in the New Yorker about you know, how should we be how should we be thinking about animals? Are they still commodities, or are they living creatures that feel and cry and are sad when they're taken away from their mothers? Yeah, and, and, and deserve to live. So, so. This is hopefully a, a segue into what you're about to talk to it's now. It's a great segue. I want to get to the meat, the meat right. or of as, the or podcast the... today that I wanted to feature, the meat of it. Why do I keep saying meat? <laughs> because you may have just heard that in Florida, Florida's governor, Ron DeSantis, has just signed a ban making and selling meat that is grown in laboratories and this ban is also being considered in other states why they tell us they're concerned about consumer safety and concerns that the technique this is what's important could hurt the beef and poultry industries and you know on one hand i think do i have something in common here with ron DeSantis? good heavens <laughs> Because you've heard me on this show. I do not support sell meat, but we're coming at it from di very different directions. And no, I don't agree with him. If, if I was going to ban sell meat, as Ron DeSantis has done in Florida, I would ban all meat. Exactly. Hello. <laughs> uh, I don't support the concept of sell meat. I'll repeat my reasonings again, as I have done on this program so many times. There's so much money that's going into the research for sell meat, which we also call lab meat or cultured meat. And a lot of it, if not all of it right now, still relies on animals to make it with these bovine, bovine serums that they require. And we're not even sure yet if this product is viable, if it will be able to be produced at a marketable price. And we don't know how safety, how safe it is to create this stuff. But as we have said many times, cell meat is not the answer. 
And Gary, as you eloquently have said in your play, Bad Hemingway by the Bay. Right, thank you, Karen. <laughs> thank you for the plug. Thank you. Coming to a theater near you soon. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, if this is the answer, maybe I didn't know the, understand the question. And I'm paraphrasing a bit here, but I don't think people are asking the right question or even know what the question is to say that this is the answer. It may appear to be the answer to angel investors and big investors who want to make more money on their money because they think this is an area that could be profitable and they have this ethical altruism kind of concept where they're doing something that's good for the planet that's also going to make them a lot of money. It's not the answer because the question in my mind should be what is the ideal diet or what are the best foods for humans to consume to improve quality of life, improve longevity, reduce the risk of chronic diseases, and also be gentle on the planet and kind to animals? That's the question. Right. And if that's the question we're asking, cell meat is not the answer. Right. Oh, and, uh and, and another thing I want to say about banning cell meat in Florida by Ron DeSantis, who allegedly is pro-life. Because if you're pro-life, why aren't you banning all meat? Exactly. Because killing animals for food is exploitive, cruel, not compassionate, stripping baby calves away from their mothers when they're just born so we can have the mother's milk and keep it from the baby calf and then slaughter the calf at a very young age after feeding it garbage so that its flesh doesn't get pink and stays white and soft so that we can consume it. That's not pro-life. No, it's not. Well said, Karen. Well said. Okay. I'm getting a little excited here. Well, I mean, there's an article that, that we just talked about before going on the air. Uh, it's a book actually that the reviewer I think is talking about and it's, the article is in the New Yorker, and it's how far should we carry the logic of an, of the animal rights movement? And you know, it's it's definitely leaning in the direction of what we're talking about now, which, which is animals have rights. Animals should have rights. They should not be treated the way they're treated. And the article this, actually reviews a number of different books. So Peter Singer put out a book called Animal Liberation in 1975 and recently came out with a, is it 50 years almost? Almost 50 year uh, revised version with some updates in it. And mm -hmm. uh, Matthew Scully, who wrote Dominion, recently came out with a new book as well. And then um, another book by Martha Nussbaum, Justice for Animals, Our Collective Responsibility. So in this article, the author is kind of discussing the, the perspectives from each of these authors and where we are and how the public reacts to them. And the world has definitely changed over the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Um, animal activists are more mainstream than they used to be. And people are paying attention to some degree but we haven't really made enough change and more animals are suffering than ever before. Right. So Karen, the bottom, the bottom line here is, are you in support of banning cellmate? I guess that's my question to you and you don't have to answer that, but <laughs> because posing well, I'm a not question. Gonna, I'm not going to agree with Ron DeSantis. No, my concern about it. And it's a very good question. One of the, justifications for banning cell meat that I read that Ron DeSantis said is that he wants to encourage freedom, freedom for people to eat flesh. And this sort of ban does not encourage freedom. And it's kind of framed in a very scary way. Because when you say one thing, you're like gaslighting. And you're saying that you're banning this because you want to give people freedom but you're taking people's choice, keyword, choice away from choosing what they want to consume. Do they want to consume animal flesh? Do they want to consume meat that's made in a laboratory? Or maybe they don't want to consume any meat at all. It's a choice. And by banning cell meat, 
he's taking away people's choice. And it's an interesting place where conservative politics is putting themselves because at one point they were against limiting government. And now that's what they're all about, getting government involved, banning women's choice on what to do with their bodies for medical procedures, and now banning cell meat. Be and, and the framing is so hypocritical because what they're really saying is we want to support animal agriculture because it's profitable and we don't want to lose money. Exactly. And what what you eloquently wrote before says just that. And they're manipulating us to believe lies, to believe stories that we need things because they want to profit. We're consumers. We're not citizens. Exactly. That's very powerful stuff, Karen. We'll and I want to make a com I want to make a comparison. So decades ago, we were made to believe that we needed GMOs. We needed genetically modified food because these scientists were creating foods that would require less, what I call biocides, less pesticides, less herbicides. They would be able to be grown in developing nations that had droughts and food scarcity issues. And this was a lie. This was just to get us on board to think we needed scientists to manipulate what nature has so beautifully provided for us. And now we see the impact and the dangers of genetically modified food. And, and I'm not even talking about whether genetically modified foods are safe or not, because it's such a difficult thing to study and prove. Although we have a lot of people with autoimmune diseases now, and it could be because of consuming genetically modified foods. But let's not go there. Where we can go is where we have proof that genetically modified foods require more and more herbicides, like Roundup Ready products, and require more biocides, more toxins put into the soil. They limit diversity. They encourage monocropping. They are not good. And they, are, they can't possibly solve food scarcity. This is a distribution problem. This is a political problem. This is a a justice problem. It's we, we have enough food right now to feed everyone on this planet. And in the future, we can probably figure out how to feed more people. But GMOs are not the answer. So when I say that, in a similar line, cell meat is being marketed to us as a solution to get people off the animal, to right. get people to stop eating meat. And that's another line. It's not going to happen. What we need to do is change the narrative. We need to educate our governments. We need to educate our educational institutions. We need to educate our society. Educate our doctors. Educate our doctors, hello, on answering the question that I posed before. The ideal diet, the best foods for humans, for quality of life, longevity, reduced chronic disease, the ideal diet or foods for humans to eat that sustain and are gentle on the environment and a diet that is compassionate to animals. And the answer is not genetically modified foods. The answer is not cell meat. Right. Well, we shall follow this story and see where it leads us. And can you imagine, Gary, banning cell meat today? What is Ron DeSantis going to ban in a month? Organic food? You know, who knows? Yeah. It's it's kind of scary. Tofu. Tofu. <laughs> I mean, we laugh, but who knows? Right. It's a bad precedent. He's a bad man. <laughs> He's a bad man. <laughs> somebody okay. said that once about so, somebody. So the, so the next thing is the solution to the problem. And I'm not serious here. But what we're being told is what we need to do is have insects. We're going to raise insects for protein because mm -hmm. we have this obsession with protein. And now people think we can get it from insects. Great. Which, 
which is more insanity because we're learning at the same time as insects are being approved for human consumption. I thought you said, you know, I I heard you say insects instead of insects. Oh, like I N S E X. Yeah, Gary. And I'm like, wait, are we are we being encouraged to have more <laughs> sex? I can, I can get behind that. <laughs> Ra, boom. Seriously, folks, this no, is I'm a family about, show. I'm, no, I, I'm talking, you're about, talking about bugs. You're talking bugs. about the bugs. The bugs. Okay. The, the bugs that do wonderful things for this planet, and the bugs will outlive all of us. And humans cannot live without bugs, as we learned from Jonathan Dalcombe on numerous programs on It's All About Food. But we're also learning about insects, that they're smart, that they feel pain, that they have emotions. Um, There's all kinds of compelling information now coming out about insects. And what do we want to do? We just want to exploit them and kill them and eat them. That's right. We certainly do. (laughs) You know, and I'd be okay with mosquitoes doing that to mosquitoes. But other than that, I'm not okay with it. And that's a joke, folks. I know there's a lot of mosquito lovers out there, but uh, that I would jokingly say that we can we can eat as many of those as we want. But I'm I'm kidding, of course. Yeah, we were talking the other day about how some, and I'm getting off topic a little bit here, but staying on topic, how some people get are more attracted to mosquitoes than other people, or attractive to mosquitoes, like mosquitoes like certain people more than they like. Well, they love me. They love me. That's why (laughs) I have a thing about mosquitoes. So, uh, but for another day, I'll leave that for another day. Yeah. Yeah. The poor, the poor insects are now going to be looked at under a microscope. Oh, thank you. (laughs) But the human nature, what can we exploit next for our own profit? Exactly. Without thinking about, the long-term repercussions. Yeah, and this has been a subject for quite a few years. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, the big thing was, oh, so-and-so had a box of chocolate-covered grasshoppers. Yeah, right. Remember that? That was yeah. like a chocolate thing for a ants, while. Grasshoppers. Chocolate-covered ants, grasshoppers. I think people have been eating insects for a long time, and now it's finally coming to the United States as a possibility. I was listening to a food podcast yesterday. Uh, it wasn't a vegan food podcast, but I like to try to keep up to date on the what's being talked about in the world of food. And they were talking about how in some cultures, mashed potatoes are considered a terrible product, unlike here in America. There are a lot of cultures around the world that don't like soft food. They like food with a crunch, Mm. more of a a snap to it. And also some of the sorbets and things in in other countries are, and when I heard this, I thought of you, which is why I'm bringing it up, are incredibly sour. The most sour thing you will have ever eaten. And that's the way the culture likes Mm. to eat Uh, unlike here in the states where it can't be sweet enough in some or it can't be soft enough we eat a lot of soft foods we eat a lot of mashed potatoes we eat a lot of we eat a lot of soft food and in other cultures soft food is is considered not food it's considered baby food and adults shouldn't be eating i I can't imagine anybody not liking mashed potatoes I know in the restaurant business, someone, <laughs> some, some chef told me once when I was first starting out a long, long time ago, because, you know, actors have to work in the restaurant business to make a living. They said that they could sell anything if they put mashed potatoes on the plate. They could sell an old shoe as long <laughs> as they put mashed potatoes on the plate. And so when I heard this on this podcast, I was, I was fascinated by the fact that a lot of cultures don't feel mashed potatoes are edible. Is that strange? Mm-hmm. I mean, come on. I can't I can't go there. I don't know. I can't what? go to that. I can't go to that country. Maybe they'll ban mashed potato. <laughs> uh, uh, funny, I, funny, funny. Ha, 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 ha. Speaking okay. of mashed potatoes, we went out to eat a few times since you've been doing this show. Are we ready to talk about what we've been eating? Yeah, sure. Let's do that. Fun stuff. Delicious stuff. Things we're grateful for. Yes. So Karen is in a show in Brooklyn and the area of Brooklyn, I think it's called Dumbo or Brooklyn Heights, but it's it's a very cool 
very hip, very, very. It's fun. Very It's Brooklyn. a fun place. Very Brooklyn. Very Brooklyn. Yeah. Neighborhood. I guess gentrified, <laughs> right? I guess oh, you could definitely say gentrified. Gentrified. Yeah. And um, there's Sorry a street. about that, but that's reality. Yeah. There's a, there's a street called Smith Street. And on Smith Street, there's a few places that one of them is a vegan restaurant. It's called Luann's Wild Ginger. You've probably heard of us talk about Luann's before. We love it there. And there's many locations throughout New York. I didn't know this. I thought Luann's Wild Ginger, there was only one location, but Karen has told me, she's enlightened me that no, Gary, Luann's Wild Ginger is all over the city. And I'm like, great. Oh, yeah, I've been to two of them. And it's a really a, a wonderful restaurant. Really interesting thing that Karen's family, I'm going to shout out to Karen's family. Karen's sister lives in Florida and brother-in-law Ralph and Karen's nephew, Mask, Max, lives in Florida. And Ralph and Lori, Karen's sister and brother-in-law, flew out to New York to see Karen in the show. Because they're the best. They are the best. And they stayed at Karen's mom's on Long Island. And they brought Karen's 90-year-old mother. 90 and a half, let's 90 just say. and a half. Lois Hartglass, if you're listening, <laughs> Lois, you're amazing. Lois went to the show and that was just the most touching thing I've ever seen. And of course, Karen's mom's next door neighbor, Lori Powers, we got to do a shout out to Lori, uh, drove them all and took care of Karen's mom while Karen was busy socializing. And we all went to Luann's and it was wonderful, wasn't it? Yeah, I'm surrounded by a lot of love. I'm grateful. It was a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. It was right before the matinee. And what did you eat, Karen, at Luann's? Oh, I've been there many times, but that particular time I had the kimchi yaki stir fry, which Right. was an udon, udon noodle and lots of vegetables like cabbage and a kind of spicy kimchi sauce. It was delicious, right? Yeah. And then there's this appetizer. It's like a little samosa triangle. But what Mm -hmm. I love about it is this green sauce it comes with. It's kind of like a limey cilantro, just delish. I could drink the, a whole cup of it. It's so good. <laughs> yeah. Now talk about your transition foods. If you are ever at Luann's, I highly recommend, and you're not a vegan, I highly recommend you get the general soy's chicken. <laughs> It's delicious. And you can eat it with a fork and a knife. You can cut it like you would cut a, a chop or a steak and you can eat it that way. It comes in one of those brilliant sauces that are filled with salt, sugar, and fat. And if you're transitioning, this is the dish for you. And whenever I'm there, I get that because it's delicious. And it's served with some steamed broccoli and some this incredible brown grain, whole grain rice. It's great. Kind of like the kind we make, which is brown rice, red rice, and black rice. It's a combination of the three of those rices and it's wonderful. Anyway, can't say enough about Luann's. I'm sure we'll put a link in the page for this podcast today. Absolutely. And there's a couple of other places on the street that Wait, have I'm vegan. not done. I'm not done with Luann's yet. Oh, good. <laughs> good. No, yeah, let's, this is great. I, I don't eat fried food very often. Lots of reasons. It's not healthy, but also I don't know what's been in the oil. If you don't, if you eat fried food anywhere other than a vegan restaurant, other things could have been fried in that oil that could be animal oriented. But Luann's, has a starter, which is um, oyster, oyster mushrooms, breaded oyster mushrooms that are fried. Wow, I did not And know that. Gary, you would eat them. Is that right? Oh my God, they are so amazing. Okay, I have to check it out. So, so good. I'm probably going to go to the show one more time, so I'm definitely going to go try them. <laughs> no, because I'm trying to broaden my horizons. Everybody who's listened to this show and listened to me Babel knows that I don't like mushrooms. So Mm -hmm. I'm really trying to evolve and I'm really trying to like mushrooms because every time we go to peace food and you get that mushroom dish with the- <sighs> So good. With, with the horse horseradish and- Parsnip horseradish puree, grilled oyster mushrooms on a bed of steamed kale. It is, oh, it is so amazing every time. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. And, and you just- 
You just, I, and I just think I've got to like this. I've got to learn how to like this. <laughs> so good. Okay. I'm glad you told me about the oyster mushroom uh, oyster. appetizer. I usually get the wrap tofu skin and it has some of the, the slimy little mushrooms in it, but I just, I pretend like <laughs> I, they're not affecting me, but I love that. I love the, uh, the tofu skin and they probably deep fry that because it's, mm. cris it's crispy. Crispy and, on the outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's great. And the desserts at Luann's are amazing. They have this chocolate mousse cake that's spectacular. It's a chocolate peanut butter bunt. Right. You know, <laughs> it's class. Okay, all of the things we're talking about, these are classic OG flavors that they they work with. You know, the general soys is obviously a, a riff on the classic dish that you find in a lot of restaurants that serve this type of food, this type of cuisine. It's not... It's not a tasting menu, menu kind of concept at Luann's. It's old school, OG, really great food. And the portions are gigantic and the desserts are incredible, but they're classic flavors, peanut butter, chocolate. There, mm -hmm. might, be, there might be a little touch of uh, whiskey in the, in the chocolate. You know, these, these, these flavors are, are very, very OG. Speaking of OG, and the things that you drink in the morning, just going back, you didn't mention the matcha, did you? Did you mention? I didn't. I do occasionally have matcha tea in addition to my other teas. And the reason I bring it up is because Lou Anne's has a matcha cheesecake and it's it's a mm. nice, it's a lovely color green. And other desserts on the street. There's a bakery called Mia's Bakery. It's not a vegan bakery, but they do have a shelf uh, located in their in their exposition case where there's several vegan options. They've got cupcakes, little chocolate cakes, little chocolate fudge cakes and things like that. It's great. Mia's Bakery on Smith Street. And also there's- It's Insom a beautiful bakery and their cupcakes are gorgeous. It's a gorgeous, yeah, I agree. It's a gorgeous bakery and it's really just fun just to walk in. It reminded me of, of again, OG New York Bakery, family run, a bunch of people behind the counter, tons of people. You could also sit down. As you walk in, they ask you, are you going to come in and sit down and have your dessert and coffee or are you going to just take it and go? And so it's it's very well organized. They've got their they've got their act down. It's probably it's probably been on the street for a while. I'm sure there was a date established since, but check out check out Mia's bakery and also there's another bakery that isn't vegan, but they have vegan options. It's a cookie bakery and it's called Insomnia. I'm not sure if there are any other locations of Mia's or Insomnia. I think but... Insomnia is a chain. I don't know about Mia's. Yeah. Smith Street is a really cool street to walk around. That whole neighborhood of Dumbo and Brooklyn Heights is really a wonderful, wonderful. You hood. know what's nice about discovering Mia's and Insomnia? I learned about both of them from people that I associate with who aren't vegan, who wanted to make sure I had a vegan option when they were bringing cookies or when they were bringing cupcakes. And they got they went to these places because they knew they had vegan options. And so I learned about them, but that's touching. That's nice. That's very nice. Yes. Uh, some of those folks are in your show, correct? Yep. Yep. And because you had a birthday while you were doing this show. I did. And they, uh, one of our leads has been feeding the cast every day with all kinds of jelly beans and cookies and fruit and treats. He's always bringing things in. And for my birthday, he brought in, I think like two dozen vegan cupcakes from Mia's bakery. Yeah, that was really nice. And they're, they're really good. They're incredible cookies. I mean, cupcakes, excuse me. I'm thinking about cookies and cupcakes now. Right. So the last thing I want to talk about. Yes. Gary. Yes. <laughs> it's one of our recipes. Yes. So what, a wonderful thing is we have hundreds of recipes at our nonprofit website, responsibleeatingandliving.com. Go there. And I go there. I go there. <laughs> and I find these recipes and I think, oh, I'll make that. <laughs> and I rediscover things that we've posted. And some of those recipes are just regulars in our house. And one of them is, I call it banana bread, but it's a date, walnut, banana loaf mini i used to make them as mini loaves and now i make them as both mini loaves and like donuts or bagels 
in one of those bagel trays or donut trays, whatever you want to call them, the round things with holes in the middle. Right. They look like a little mini bunt, but that's not a bunt. It's actually a, a, a donut, a donut or bagel tray. But I think I think they're really wonderful. And uh, you don't need any oil on on this pan. It's but it's not your typical it's a safe non-stick pan. Yeah, it's safe non-stick. Anyway, keep going because this so is a great story. So this is story. a very simple recipe. I think it's simple. And it's like it's like taking your bowl of oatmeal in the morning and making something fun out of it because it's made with rolled oats that we grind into a flour. It has ripe bananas in it, walnuts, dates, a little vanilla, a little water, and some baking powder. And it's, really it's like good. totally yummy. It's and it's dense and just delicious. Not now, too sweet. It goes great with a little with any kind of schmear you want on it. We like Karen put guacamole on hers. I mean, it's really a great combination. And again, we, you know, avocado is a is a fruit. So it's But it, it's interesting cuz you said not too sweet. I want to say that the sweetness can vary. So in the mm -hmm. recipe, it calls for four ripe bananas. And maybe I should say a certain volume of mashed bananas instead, because the size of a banana can vary. And depending on how ripe it is or where it comes from, the sweetness of a banana can vary. And this particular time, I used three really big bananas instead of four bananas, because we only had three and they were really big. <laughs> Yeah, maybe a weight. Maybe we should do it by weight. They maybe. Say, and they were really ripe. And eight. so that made the banana bread just sweet enough. You said not too sweet, but I but think it, what I sweet. what I meant was, and thank you for, for correcting me on that. What I meant was not too sugary sweet. I did I wasn't correcting you. I no. was embellishing. No, I know you weren't correcting me, but <laughs> you were you were being kind. It wasn't sugary sweet. Like we were talking about Mia's bakery and insomnia bakery. Those are sh sugary sweet bakeries. This mm -hmm. was a different kind of sweet. It, and, and I want to say healthy sweet because that turns people off, but it was just a better sweet. It's a better sweet. Well, the dates also add plenty of sweetness. Yeah. Oh, dates are amazing. Yeah. So all amazing. I'll add the recipe to this podcast post and I hope you make it. Let us know what you think about it. I think it might be one of my favorites because like I just said, it's like transforming your bowl of oatmeal into something really spectacular. Right. It's delicious. I agree. Do it. Make it. And let us know if there's any other recipes that you try on the site that you like or that maybe we should adjust. If you make them, we've had listeners in the past tell us I made it and it didn't work, but I added this and it did work. So if you find that that's, it's a work in progress here. So if you find if that's your the case with you as well, or your oven is different. So you maybe thought about having to turn it a little mm -hmm. higher or what have you, let us know and we'll make the adjustments. That's very true about baked goods because depending on the pressure the barometric pressure, depending on the elevation, depending on the temperature outside, depending on your kind of oven, old or new convection or not, things bake differently. Exactly. So don't get frustrated. If you try something and it doesn't work out, try again. You could reach out to us and ask us questions. We'll try and help you. But keep going and you'll discover wonderful things. Find exactly. your kitchen. Find your kitchen. Get to know me. <laughs> Gary. Karen. Hey, thank you for coming on with me today. Yeah. Sharing your your writing and your thoughts. Just so fabulous. Thank well, you. Well, I just want you to know that your influence on me has been positive. And I really feel that it is also positive on other listeners. And so on that note, if you like what you hear, let us know. If you don't like what you hear, there are so many other options for you. Don't listen anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, all right, Karen. Great talking to you today. Yes. Thank you. And thank everybody for listening. Everybody. Have a delicious week. Have a delicious week. Woo.